Now I'm asking you, what is S? Remember I said, from here, so you graduate high school and, and do your math degree. S, when you're talking about lines, is always going to refer to our thing. So I'm going to put that over here as well. What am I going to put in for N, Sydney? N always represents the arc measure or central angle measure. So what would I put in for N? Oh, 30. Okay, I, you went and I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. I look more of a fan. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm glad that it came back. All right, Varun, does two change? No. It's a constant. Does pi change? No. It's a constant. What am I going to put in place of the radius, though? Radius is, let's see. That's a one. one. So it's directly plus. Ah, this is already given in terms of radius. Oh, one. One. Now, real quick, as an aside, Varun, then what's the diameter? So the diameter is if two. It's, yeah, it's two. Per, does that mean if... So that means we tried to plug L from R will be 2 times down, so it'll be 6.28 well, times 30 over 360. So. <laughs> yeah, you're way. But remember, I asked for it in terms of pi. Oh, so the first thing we want to do, two, bring the pi down. 2 times 30. So that's um, 60, and 2 times 360 is. Be careful, Varun. This is 2 over 1, and then we multiply straight across. Oh, so, that, so that means it's 60 over 360. And that means it's going to be equal to 1 over 2. And then we multiply these together. This is just pi over one. And we get pi over six. And we're getting back into my bad habit of creating a parabola. All right, I'm gonna give one more. Then I'm gonna have everyone shout out the answer in the time. So I'm gonna answer questions first. Let me go add me for him. This one, because R is to the first power, um, so keep in mind here, whatever degree you have tells you what dimension you're working in. This is a point or no dimensions. R to the first is just length. 
So the long r squared is length and width, which is what we call area. And then r to the third is length, width, height, which is what we call volume. So since I'm looking at a line, and a line is in one dimension, my variable for the radius has to be in one dimension. And I know that's 2 pi r. If I was looking for the area, I need two dimensions. I need length and width. So that's going to be pi r squared. That exponent tells you how many dimensions you're looking at. If you guys go to college for math, eventually you'll get to a point where this is really hard to answer, so you just go r4 and then you have, you know, you just make it up and then it works really easy there and you can say, okay, if we had that dimension, we can Obviously, you're not going to be tested on that here, but I will give you that bit of a preview that as you go further into math, you can just increase the dimensions as long as you add a variable. So 2 pi r is for arc length because a line is in one dimension. I'm going to erase just this part so no one accidentally puts pi r squared on here. Actually, I'm going to erase. Let's do this. Varun, give me your favorite number between 1 and 180. Uh, 31. Oh man, I was going to say 25. Okay, that was my best for you. All right, if we have a 31 degree central angle, and Hollow, what would you like the radius to be? Uh, three. three? That means we'll get 93, 12. Yeah, this will work out really nice. What is the arc length? In terms of pi. What I'll do is I'll wait one minute, and I'll just say, everyone shout it up. And then we'll see where we're at. Yep. And this is going to bring up the perfect time. But once again, talk about how to simplify fractions on this calculator. If you don't know how to do that and you don't have one, let's grab one. I don't need a calculator. Huh? I don't need a calculator. You don't need it? No. What if you did need it? What if you had like 4 million 16 over 360? Then it's I'm always too scared of the time left on the test to ever do that. But I do admire the confidence you have there. And just so you guys can feel confident before you shout out your answer, I'll make the substitutions to see if you can see if you put it in right. If not, do what I used to do in fourth class and just do. And then I learned that they can tell because they're trained that you're not actually seeing. And then I just change the like What's that, Bruno? I got the answer. You feel confident about it? I feel okay. Yeah. I, my goal today, Bruno, is when I ask you, do you feel confident? All you do is say yes immediately. Yeah. You, you're, you're at the point now you said yes, no. I hate this idea. I'm ready for you to be. Okay. My substitutions are going to be this N is 31. times 2, times 5, times 3. So go ahead and shout out your answer that you got. 31. 31. Yeah, that was a quiet shout out. what did you get? Oh, she's still working. Am I, too, am I going too fast? Becca, what did you get? Are you still doing it? When you multiply it all the way through. Am I going too fast? Because it's, uh, I, I'm just kind of excited that we're all back in person right now. Let me give you guys a few more seconds. I'll tell you what, when I see six people give me a thumbs up that they're ready to shout out their answer, and you're just going to multiply this through. And what I'm assuming is going to happen though is some people are going to have it simplified somewhere. Shana, what's up? Do you multiply by six, like the 31 times? Yeah, definitely combine these first. This is going to be six pi times. Oh god, here we go really bad. Yeah, 31 over 360. I have a question. Burn, go for it. Why don't you push it to you'll see like. Yeah, that's why we're spending so much time on it. Yeah, why don't you arc for the degree? That fits all over the books, yeah. But would I like give you like these like 30 degrees like 31 degrees? That's what I'm. Yeah. 
when I buy the review books, this is exactly what they look like. Alright, did I get any thumbs up yet? Got one, two, straight up thumbs down, and I see your work. Depends on how far your teacher gets. Um, I learned when I taught algebra to are pushed a lot faster than the others. Um, you'll learn log when we the last thing you You'll learn log exponents. I think you touched the fundamental theory of algebra. If not, it'll definitely do it with me in pre calc um, I mean, You don't do trades, right? Not right now. If you do any trade in algebra 2, it's just memorizing the unit circle. Oh. But we kind of touched on that a little bit in here. You'll learn this in every degree that matters in between. And all right, let's try again. What do we get? What do we get in terms of pi? What's your numerator, guys? Thirty-one. Did we multiply the six through yet? For one eighty-six. And then it simplified back to thirty-one. Yeah. Beautiful. All right, what's our denominator? Sixteen. Bree, did I mess you up? No, you did it right. Then I told you to multiply the six again. I didn't see that step. Oh, well then it's going to go right like that. All right. Are we good? Jana. How do you simplify the, I mean, you said in class, but how do you simplify the fraction? On the calculator? It's yeah. almost like I told you, you better ask if I want to talk about it anyway, so thank you. So on this calculator, I'm going to go ahead and do six times 31. And I'm going to see that that's 186. Let me do this right here. Sorry for the close-up, guys. So I've got 186, right? I know that's what my numerator needs to be. So I'm going to come back, and I'm going to press 186. And then there's this ABC button down here right by the back arrow. Bottom left of the calculator, immediately to the left of the number 1. When I press that, I get this little right angle thing. It should say 186 right angle. ABC. No second yet. So you should have one ABC. ABC. Oh. Right up there. You're fine. I've been in the for four years and I have never found a problem. Now, we, once we have that little right angle, hit 360. And you should have 186 right angle 360. Hit equals and you get 31 over 60. It does it for you. I think mean, it's just so much easier. Wait, Go ahead, Bob. Yes, exactly. Yeah, if you had like 1 over 6 yeah. times pi, yeah, you just put pi 6. So if it's any other number, you just put pi next to it? It's a preference, actually. You can do it either way you want. You're saying, let me just double check that. But if I had, I could write it as. Like that? Okay. That's your preference, right? It's just a multiplicate. This, when you get to pre calc, it'll probably be implied that you should do this. But for now, you can do either one. Arc length in degrees. So basically, um, arc length in degrees and arc length in radians is 50 feet. Right. Say it one more time. Arc length in degrees and arc length in radians is the same thing. Pretty, yeah, because the radians is a measure in degrees. It's just better to work in radians as we get further along the channel. And that means that, like, this part right here is that ball. So if you want to know how far that is, you can do 31 divided by 60 times pi and say how far you're All right. Let's move to, oh, computation. All right, this one's the easy one. Arc length and radians. That's the next page.
And here's a little sneak peek as to why you're going to want to keep using radians as you get further along. When I see you in a couple years, I'll ask you guys to write it in radians. Again, arc length represented by S. When it's in radians, it's just theta times the radius. Um, Renee, give me your favorite number. Um, seven. Seven, okay. We'll make that the radius. And then let's just do two pi half doesn't make any sense, but let's just pi. Um, let's, let's just call this two pi. So let's break this down really quick. This is our length again. This is theta. That represents my central angle measure in radians. That's just 2 pi. And I like this one right now because it goes back to this question. How do we write that? Well, this is the same as 2 pi over 1 or 2 pi. So it still looks like that 2 pi third that we were dealing with earlier. We just picked a little wonky number, which is no problem. But the user would be 14. Varun, tell me the answer again. 14 is not one. Varun, that is it. Oh, you just do that. You just multiply your radian measure times your radius, and you're done. And that's why you memorize, well, bit of a hypocrite here. I never even knew about the unit circle, so Mr. Castillo showed it to me. But you memorize all of these, and then you can find a bunch of information here. All right? That's pre cal But priming you for this, showing you why this one's so much nicer. I'm going to go in purple on the left side here for you guys to practice one. Um, let's go 12. Uh, let's call this 3 pi halves with a radius of 12. What does S equal in this case? Make sure that when you multiply these, this is understood to be 12 over 1 and you go straight across. Is that the 2 under? This is the 2 under answer. Watching the video and you saw me pause there and then do this, that was my brain rebooting trying to cover the show now. I ever write this, 
Let me know what you're wrong. And then you'll punch in the calculator 18 times pi. And then there should be directions saying where to round it. So here I'm going to get 56.5. Let's call it 5, 5, because what I really get is 5, 4, 8. So that'll round up. So that's the approximation of our arc length. We don't actually know the final arc length yet. But if you really think about it, when you get to the 100 millionth place of a decimal, that's the difference between your foot, the atom, and your foot vibrating, right? Like you're not getting any closer, it's not making a difference. So that's why we can approximate it comfortably even in the real world. Now, oh, we answered it and Bruno asked your question, right? Yeah. Perfect. Now we're going to go into our second dimension. Everything we've done so far is in one dimension. So, the way I look at it is, because someone did kind of ask, here's my room, here's the water fountain. The expectation is if you're in class and you have to go to the water fountain, you'll walk from here to here. That's the arc length, right? I have 25 kids in the room and normal year, one person leaves. I can't watch to make sure that Mr. Kimball walks from here to here. Mr. Kimball has this entire area to wander around and so the smart class runs out where his teacher says, this is the third time you walk by my room and knock on the glass. Where are you supposed to be? So if you think about it, I don't only have this direction to walk. I can also go this way. So I have two dimensions, right? I have length and width on this board. Obviously, I can go upstairs, downstairs, in 3D. But this could be my path. Talk to Mr. Fernandez, run up front, talk to Coach Phil, get some water, right? Definitely longer. So I have this entire area to roam. So in that same area, we have two dimensions, and we have to consider all of that. So when I ask for a smart pass in the two-dimensional plane here, what's the total area that I'm allowed to roam around becomes? 221. This is room 221. That's just my room. Let's do that. That's a good point. Let's not put numbers on the board just yet. So let's say this is the campus, right? This is inside the building. And then this is parking, the outside area. I definitely can't get outside of them. So I'm going to figure out how much can I wander just in here. Broom, give me a radius. Uh, seven. And an angle. Uh, 130. 130. Broom is giving me a lot of room to go wander around. I'm going to need more than five minutes the way I walk. All right. I thought I had another pen. That's really what I spend my time doing is looking for everything I've lost in my own box. Now. Pi square. Say again. Do you use pi square? Why do we use pi square? That was going to actually be my question, but since you asked me, wait, tell me why you think so. I thought, oh, wait, this is the part of the second. Yeah, this, no, you're absolutely right, but why are we using pi square? This is the area of the circle, right? This is the area. of the entire circle. Now, Chloe, what are we going to put in front of this since we're restricted to just this part, or this percentage? Uh, 10. Over 360, yep. Right? And over 360 just means from this 130 degree spread out seven units, this is all the area that I get to wander around in before the alarms are really triggered, right? As soon as I open that door, that's not supposed to happen. So, what is my end value? Uh, 130. 130. 360 is a constant, that's the whole way around the circle. Pi is a constant, even though it's irrational. What goes in place of my radius, though? Seven. Seven. And I'm going to square that. I'm using a calculator for this one after this next step. 49. 49, perfect. 
I'm going to go ahead and move pi over here. I can multiply in any order I want. Now, this is where, this is why I asked you this question, Maroon. What if you end up with something like this? Are you still going to want to do this all by brain? Yeah. Mentally? Yeah. Brain. Yeah. 130 times 49, what's that? I think I won that one. It's 6370. This is what, I'm only stressing this right now because you are on the time test. These two together make this, and I'm going to have 365 left over. Now, if I'm Varun and I'm confident that I have enough time to do that, I can start simplifying and get rid of these zeros. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to turn my calculator back on, clear out the memory, and I'm going to press 6370 ABC 360. And what I should have is that 6370, that right angle. Oh, wait. Um, Yeah, so they're not always going to be nice. Once I do that, this one's going to need an extra step. I'm going to hit equals, and I get something new back that we didn't talk about before. On my display, I should have 17 bar 25 right angle 36. Does everyone have that if you're doing it this way? When you write something like this in terms of pi, you want it in an improper fraction. Mm -hmm. Now, I can do 36 times 17 plus 25, or I can hit second ABC, which city, that's what you were talking about earlier. I got two. If I hit second ABC, I get... Did anyone not get that? Good chance I made a mistake if we're not at the reason. Now, the room said you got it. What did you say you got, sir, on the calculator? Like 17.694 repeat? Yeah. That's still the right answer. But, Arun, if you're taking the EOC and you've got to punch that in, here's what's going to happen to you 17.69, that takes all of three seconds. When do you stop hitting four? At graduation? That's for repeating forever, right? Yeah, forever. Yeah, it's forever. So we have two ways we can do this. We can either agree to make sure we put it in an exact answer as an improper fraction, or you guys can watch me until 2 o'clock. Yes. Yeah, Varun, you want to switch it over? Okay, because I'm getting tired of this. But my 4 is already getting a little bit nicer as I go. So this is why we want to know how to do it this way, because they're going to say, give me an exact answer. If I stop here, that's not the right answer. This is more accurate, still not the right answer. This is more accurate, still not the right answer. I want to keep it just like that. Okay. Now, if it asks you to round it, then you would say something like this and something. Oh. Oh, you did 49 times 130, and then you put that on 360? Yes. I did 49 times 130 and 360, but it's together. In the calculator on your own? Yeah, I yeah. don't mind. Yeah, yeah, you're just doing it more efficiently. I just don't want to skip steps. Okay. But if you guys can do it more efficiently, that's why what I would do sitting at my desk. So yeah. yeah. Any questions on this one? Sydney. Gotta put it in this way. Oh. Now I'm just gonna take this one from you because this battery is dying, so the other one would have been out here. Wait, was this yours from home? No, that's not. Yeah. I was making sure I'm not committing a touch on camera. <laughs> um, Alright. Oh yeah, you're right. That if you divide that with it's gonna be seven point one six nine. Four forever, right? Yeah. Now Varun, if you were trying to convert that, you'd go crazy, right? Uh, it's forward all the way down. Okay. Did you just hit that one? Sorry, that one. All right, Bree. Here's where you ask, how do we find a fourth? 
So Bree said earlier, how do you find a quarter? Well, let's find a quarter. Wait, the area of Did I skip one? Area of circle and degree. Oh, I gave you the, so that was all for this one. <laughs> this was literally just to show you pi r squared. So on this one, just do this. And then on the other one, just write, and then you're done. We actually covered it, though. I guess I could have saved uh, 15 prints by doing that. Oh my god, we're going fast. Do you feel like you're moving fast? Yeah, it's just like 10 fingers away. It's been almost two hours. This walk in by 30 minutes and eight or five. It does feel like we've been here maybe 45 minutes to me. Oh, yeah. It is eight o'clock. Okay, is it going too fast though? Or is it that you're getting a good pace learning, but you're covering a lot of content? Yeah, we're really wrong. All right, let me mess up that feeling for you. We've been here for two hours and we're still in the first topic of seven. But the other thing, <laughs> no, okay. All right, is it okay? Just, I wanted to show you the area of the circle pi r squared. I don't know why I thought that needed to be two separate slides. Let's do some practice problems, and then we're gonna move on to topic eight. Topic eight. Huh? Topic eight. Sign, 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 that is our trade part. You either get a big break from trade and algebra two, except for maybe the unit circle, depending on the teacher, and then you're going to be doing nothing but trade when you throw that. Adam. You crossed out circle and put segment. What's the difference between a segment and a section? Did I put the wrong word? Probably. Yeah. Let's go back. It is a sector, not a segment. That'd be great. So let's read. So now we're going to have this. Now do this and put section. All right. It's good that all of our mistakes are concentrated on one side. And they're just both have mistakes. Oh, okay. All right. So. Oh, no. All right, can you guys see on your paper what those numbers are supposed to be? Is that 60? Green, right? 
And I say, all right, it's, you know, kindergartner. Here's where we're at talking. And you guys start talking. I'm like, this is it. That's supposed to be red. It's not red. Red goes up here. 32 should go up here and show you the one. This is bad visual communication. But to help you guys, and what I want to talk about it is, if it doesn't say round, but you definitely need to round, look at it again and see if you can figure out a way to make sense out of it so that it does work. Now, is that fair to you? Not at all. Do I know that the EOC will do this? Not at all. But my plan, again, teach you here so the EOC test you here, and talk about strategies that kind of help you make sense of the world. Now, with that being known, the whole thing is 32. What should go here and what should go here? Why is it 16? Brittany, I'm going to ask you for that one. Yeah. That's the radius. Um, yeah, remember the radius has this, none of these are actually the radius. The radius has to start at the center and go to the edge. It's, like half it's half of it, right? This whole thing is 32. This shows me that it's cut into two equal parts. 16 plus 16 gives me 32. What is 16? How does this radius like, this is this is 16 the whole part? Say it again? This is like 16 to 16 the whole part. You guys are going to laugh at me? Guess what I just did? I put the wrong one up. So watch for this one. Room, go ahead. Do you think 16 and 16 will be the whole problem? Is 16 and 16 for what? No, 16 and 16. Is it going to the whole problem? Yeah, it will. So, here, we had a theorem that said if this line starts at the center and goes to here and it hits it at 90 degrees, and I have another line that starts at the center, hits a chord at 90 degrees. If this line and this line are equal, then these are equal. How do these two? Right here? Yeah. By theorem. I don't remember the name of the, the number. But we had that theorem that said if they start at the center and they hit the chord at 90 degrees, and the length from center to the chord where it hits at 90 degrees is the same, these are bisected. Maroon, that's what we're setting it up for. So much in this class is to try and get it set up to be a circle of some sort. Now, if I draw from here to here, this is the radius, right? I started at the center, and I happened to stop right where this chord begins. Maroon, what did you just tell me you were starting to see? The triangle, right? Yes, but I, because I'm making a big test and I'm going to be careful, I'm going to redraw this triangle. What is the length of this part at the bottom? Let's call this the bottom. 16, right? Do I know the radius yet? No, nope, the radius happens to be the hypotenuse. So that's my radius. And I know this part is 60. Now that I'm looking at this, that should have been 32. There was another problem where it was in the same position. But I'm 16. Oh, like 16. 16, yes, sir. So since this and this are congruent, that's 16, and then this is the like this. I have a right triangle. I know two of the sides. This is going to be 3,600. Double checking on this for 256. 16 times 16 is 256. 225 for 15. Is it good? Okay, add those together and I get 3856. That's going to be the one. I went on that little tirade about the way Chris sets it up. The next question in the homework has it at 40, I think, you have to divide by two. This is going to tell me that r is equal to the square root of 3856. I updated the directions to say round. Give me the first five digits on your screen when you take the square root of 3856. I don't know where it is. 63, 10, 0, 9, 6. That'll work. So if I say round to the nearest tenth, change from an equals to an approximate, and we get 62.1. Now, you're going to be able to do this every time you encounter a problem like this. Your goal 
with this is to try and create a right triangle so that you can use the Pythagorean theorem. If you can get to that point, knock it out with the theorem. If I show you something and you're like, wait, you could have just used the Pythagorean theorem four steps ago. Tell me that. Yes, sir. Wait, you said that's no wrong thing, right? Yeah, I know. And then I said I put my foot in my mouth and I put the one that wasn't wrong. Yeah. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do on your own is do it when that's actually 32 for just that side. So what I'm going to do is wait a minute, let everyone copy it down, ask questions. Shana, go for it. That's all I was doing the whole time, just solving for the radius. Hey, can I try a new, new problem? That's exactly what we're about to do, yes sir. Now, because I put my foot in my mouth, I'm going to change this 32 to something else. And then we're going to apply that. That number is going to be equal on both sides, split up. And we're going to go ahead. Abby, go ahead. On the DOC, whatever number they give us, like where it says 32 at the beginning, should we assume the entire thing is 32, no matter what the foot? No, that's what I was starting with, and I put the wrong problem. I, I put I added this one tomorrow just to talk about it. So no, I couldn't add it. I added it this morning. I was going to add it. Um, no, assume that it's in the right spot. What I was saying is here, if this 32 doesn't work out, but the directions didn't say it around, try it again without dividing it by 2. Try the 32 there. The directions should match the expected answer. It's never going to tell you to round if it's a whole number. Or if it does, it's kind of cruel, especially on the state test, right? So try it the way you see it first, and if you get stuck, flag it for review, come back and see if maybe something else in the test sparks your memory or a new way to try it. Any questions about how I did all of this? All right, now we're going to rewind the clock, take my foot out of my mouth, and I'm going to give you this one to try. And so it's crystal clear. I'm going to tell you that I want the length of line segment KL to be 64. And I want you to tell me, is this an N here? And what's this letter, J? Broom, what, what's the point at the center? N? I can't uh, yeah. Is this a J? Yeah. Yeah. Is it? I'm going to submit this to my eye doctor because I just. No. What I want you to find is the length of JN. No directions here to round, so you should not expect to have to round. Yeah, oh, sorry, yes, I didn't change the size. It's still there. You got a nice phone number in the room? Yeah.
That's it. All right, on the count of three, shout out your answer, but be confident because everyone looks good. One, two, three. 68. Yeah, 68. So Pearson was right on this one. Symbol was wrong. Whole thing 64. This is 32. 60 squared plus 32 squared. Is equal to r squared, and you might be saying, but you only wrote it here, and you're trying to find this. Well, this and this are both radii, so they're equal. Oh, that's not it. Jamie. So if I find this, I know that right away. All right. Good. Three. Big million dollar question for you. What's the diameter of this circle? Huh? Well, if I know the radius, what do I have to multiply the radius by to get the diameter? Yeah. So there you go. Pop it in the calculator, tell me what it is, you found your four. Perfect. Now, let's do one other thing. We know this guy is 68. And guys, bear with me, because I know you know that I know that you know the answer to this already. But Bree, I want you and everyone else to find JK. And don't worry about this K right here. I couldn't see it until I said. Bree, what is the length of this guy right here? 32. How did you know it was 32? Because it was given, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. But what I wanted to show Bree was she asked for a chord, and I gave her that special case diameter. She already has all the math here. This time, we know the hypotenuse of so 68 squared minus 60 squared is equal to the length of JK squared, right? When I do all that math, I'm going to get this is 32. So what's the length of this chord? So this line cuts this into 32, and I have 32 two times. So I'm just going to add them together. Why is my tree so bad? What's 32 plus 32? That's how we find the length of the chord. Oh. Okay. Any questions before we move on? Maroon, go for it. This is the. So the, the one up there is subtracting and the like, congruence from the one down there. Yes, sir. And then when you're trying to find like the radius, you. You divide it by two, like if it's if it's eighty, if it's if you have the full length, yes sir. If it's nineteen would be forty five, and then you put and then would be then you do put the plug in the five five and zero would be forty five square minus minus sixty square would be it's, it's only forty five though if this part's twenty seven point five and this is twenty seven point five. So just probably just base just base this one point five into one. Yes, everything in here we're trying to boil that down to Pythagorean. Okay. Yeah. Alright, let's do this one. Say it again. Say it again. Bathroom. Bathroom? Yeah. Oh, is that what this means? Yeah. I thought that was the letter A, I'm sorry. I was like, A what? Oh, okay. Yeah, go. <laughs> I've learned more sign language in tutoring. I know enough to be misunderstood. <laughs> so on this one it says, if PQ, that's this guy right here, is tangent to the circle P, yeah, and PS is Wait, no, that's not what it says. If PQ is a tangent to circle R at Q, I drew that right, and PS is tangent to R. Wait, didn't it basically say congruent? Tangent, remember, is saying that it touches the circle R only once, and when it touches, the radius meets it at 90 degrees. So basically, what it's telling us is. S and Q with their tangent line meet at 90 degrees. 
what's the other perimeter of the whole thing? I'm going to redraw QRP. This is 90 degrees. QR is 5. PR, a portion of it. I'm going to draw the arc here. On this side is 4, but I have no idea what this part is. And it wants to know the perimeter, so I need to know this. Let's call this alpha rho delta. Just random variables, but I have no idea what other letters I'm in writing, so I'm putting ones that I know I'm not familiar with. My hypotenuse length is unknown, but I do know my radius, so that's some help. Is there anything? looking at either my independent drawing or the diagram given that will help us find either PR or QR. And then I'm going to kind of look at this and say, well, PR would be a reasonable thing to get. QR is already given. And it's telling me I have to find PQ. So that's going to give me a hint that there has to be something here that will tell me what the length of Q Q is. Did I draw this one? PR is right. QR is right. That's right. Where did I label this part on? PQ is what we're finding. Oh, PR. QR is right. That's what I'm going to say. Same guy. I did something wrong. So, how would I find PR? Chloe? Ask QR and PQ. Say that one more time? I heard add PT plus QR. Yeah. You're absolutely right. But if we were writing this in a proof, we run into a small problem. Oh, yeah. So you're, you're going to send me to the substitution, right? Yeah. What would my substitution make this be? PT plus what? Yeah. Or, and that's going to give me 9. My question to everyone else in the class is, how do we go from PT plus QR to that to get that radius? Shana. How did we know to use QR? Great question. That's actually the question I asked too. So the question is, how do we know to use QR here? Well, if I look at this, QR is a radius. TR is a radius as well, right? Yeah. I knew what QR was. This is going to give me 4 plus 5 equals 9. But that doesn't really help me here, except for what do we know about the radius of every radii of a circle? So I can come in here and I can substitute QR's length for TR, and I know that's also 5. Then, because of the segment addition postulate, because this ends where this one begins, I can cut it out and just make PR by adding them together. So we knew to use QR because we weren't cutting any corners, which I'm really happy about. And we did a substitution, and we knew that this part here is now 9. Well, I'm but let me ask where you're confused so we can go from where you are. I'm so confused on like this whole, how did we? All right, is this the part that's confusing? Yeah. All right, let's talk about it in a different way. Let's get a step back from the more rigorous proof right here. And let me ask you this, Arun. If I go from R to here, how far is that? And then this is a radius, right? Yeah. If I go from here to here, what is that? That's cool. Okay. From, from the center to the circumference, is that a radius or a chord? What do we have there? That's a sector, right? Oh, don't look at this. I'm only looking at the line itself. Oh, sorry. What line right. is this? Is that a chord, a radius, a secant? What do we have there? From R to T. 
That's the sequence. Remember, this would be a sequence. Oh, oh, no, this is a tangent. The sequence would be touching twice like this. Oh, um, that's, that's a radius. Perfect. And you already told me that QR is a radius too, right? And isn't the radius always equal to every other radius? Yeah. So if QR is 5, then RT is 5 because they're both radii. Is that fair? So now if I put 5 here, I can see that this whole line is just 5 plus 4 for 9. Wait, I also have a question. Yeah, go for it. QR, is it also, is, isn't it QR and uh, a big line there? Can you run the condition? Sorry, what? QR here. Congruent to the uh, to PR? PR? Where's P? Yeah. Wait, no, not PR. Not PR. PR. It is, yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing here. Is there another line that these are congruent to? There's one more given. There's. Uh, R, is it? You got the first letter. Yeah, perfect. These are all radii, so they're all equal to each other. We know all of these are five. So I can go ahead and get rid of my delta or whatever that is, sigma, and put a five here as well. Now, Varun, what I did is I took this triangle, purple, green, green, and I drew it over here. But this part is the part RP, nine and five. What kind of triangle do I have here, guys? It's a right triangle. Where's my hypotenuse? Remember, even though I'm bad at drawing, this would still be pointing straight across to my hypotenuse. I'm just going to write hypo. Yeah, the hypotenuse is the biggest. The hypotenuse is always the longest. So now, I have a right triangle, I have two sides. What theorem am I going to use automatically? A squared plus B squared. A squared plus B What do we call that one? Pythagorean theorem. I've lost two markers. That's because I'm holding this in this unit and they're in my right pocket. All right. So this is going to be C. Broom, is this A or B? That's B. How do you know? It doesn't matter, right? A plus B, B plus A. Perfect. So, I'm trying to solve, hopefully, after all this, for PQ. PQ means that A squared plus 5 squared equals 45. That's 9 and a half. 9 squared. P is P is P. That's 41. I hope so. Oh, no. Wait, is this wrong? No, wait, is it? No, 51. Is it 51? What is it? 56. Man, Bruno, I have so much confidence in you, man. Thank you. Now, I have to take the square root of that. And then I look over here, and I feel defeated. I don't have a 56 there. Anybody else feel defeated? Or does anybody else have a next step forward? I, didn't, I know what it is, but just. I think you can. Um, I think. 5 plus 4, you can, it's going to be. I think this is my idea. I think it's C. Okay, Varun says. I'm going to put Varun right here next to C. Yeah. Now, Sid, do you have a way to verify Varun? Um, yes. How would you do it? Everything you've done so far, yeah. pretty much is. Is uh, if you have the same exactly number outside it of the square root and the same number as inside, inside you can add the total. Yep, seven. Let's see what we land. So everyone, what Sydney was saying is we can simplify this to be two square root of 14. Touch that probably in algebra one briefly, but you'll be tired of doing this in algebra two quickly. All this is telling me is that PR is two square root of 14. I'm gonna go back and erase this. 
What did I find? No, not P, or is it? No, we found PQ, right? Oh, yeah, PQ was the point. Mm. I, I. Go ahead, Brian. I just think it's, um, it's, it's P because I think because. It's okay, let's finish it. So, we know 2 square root of 14 is that PQ. We know QR is 5. Varun, you've already told us RS is 5. Oh yeah, oh wait, this is uh, And now do you see what Devin was saying? Yeah. So let me ask you guys this. Let's skip forward a little bit to congruency. If this is a right angle and this is a right angle, PR is always congruent to PR by the reflexive property, and QR and RS are congruent because they're radii. Doesn't this mean I can flip? I have two choices here. I can reflect across PR, and everything will line up. The 5 goes to the 5, 2 square root of 14 would come here, the 90 degree angles would match up, PR matches up. These are congruent, so I don't have to do any more work through congruency. Also, I can ask myself the three questions, and if you aren't in my class, we'll get to those in a minute. But those are basically, are both of my triangles right triangles? Yes. Are there hypotenuse congruent? PR is always congruent to PR, so that's a yes. And is there a pair of corresponding congruent legs? If I flip these over, these will match up and they're congruent. I have my three yeses. By the hypotenuse leg theorem, these are the same triangle. But I'm looking for the perimeter of a quadrilateral. So I'm going to add up all of these, and what we end up with is 5 plus, plus 5 plus 2 square root 14 plus 2 square root 14, leaving me with 10 plus 4 square root 14. And that would be B. Abby. Can I ask you a question? Go for it. Remember, what if, where we got 56, what if that wasn't divisible by 2? Okay, let's do. What is 56 times 3? 168? Yeah. Oh, it is a little bit too good. Let's do this. How about 27? Oh, no, no, no. Huh? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. 27 times 3. So you're introducing a dangerous element without all the two here, and that's skipping and stuff. What I'm going to tell you to do, guys, is let's do this first. Let's list the prime number. What's the smallest prime number? Three. One. Five. I'm here on Y. Right. If you think it's one, raise your hand. All right? If you think it's two, raise your hand. I have one vote for two in my vote, so I'm going to go with two first. Let me ask you, let me just point something out, and if you're watching this and you've taken a higher level math test, don't, don't tell me wrong. What's the definition of a prime? It can only be divided by itself and one, right? And those have to be unique. But it becomes a problem when there's no other way to write two unless I do one times two to get two, right? Or two times one to get one. What I'm saying is, if this is division this way, it has to be multiplication backwards. So this would just be 1 times 2 equals 2. 1 times 1 equals 1. If I go backwards, 1 times 1 equals 1. The problem is, 1 satisfies both of these requirements at the same time. And for it to be prime, you have to be able to divide by yourself and one, it has to be two unique numbers. Do we have both cases for one times one though? We get both cases, cases, cases simultaneously, one is not prime. Now, if you want a better explanation than that, other than just a surface, um, you know, definition talk, we can definitely do that later, like during review week, especially if you're exempt from the final, we can spend the whole next two hours talking about a better way to think about it. But the definition of prime is only divisible by itself and one using those unique numbers. And one doesn't work because it does both cases at once. So it doesn't satisfy both, only satisfies one. 
This would be a great time to talk about truth tables. Go ahead. I just, uh, but you say one isn't prime. It is not prime. But it seems, could it like be multiplied, multiplied or divided by itself? It can. And it is also multiplied or divided, or it can be divided by itself as well, right? Yeah, yeah. but how is it not able to be? It needs to be uniquely divisible by itself, which is what we have here, right? Yeah. Two divided by two, same number here, not. Okay. And it has to be able to do this. These numbers in the circle oh. must be different. Here, it's the same for both, and it doesn't work. Well, that is your geometry definition of prime. But two years from now, I will accept that. Okay, so if you're so, so when you're talking about prime, it has to be, it has to be the different same number. So like, it has to be the same number twice to get one, and it has to be the divisible by one to get it double. Yeah, and for four, if it's if it's a two, it's the same thing. So let's talk about why four satisfies these conditions, or doesn't satisfy. Four divided by one is four, right? Yeah. We're good here. Four divided by two is two, and that's not correct. Exactly, we don't have unique numbers. They fail. Yeah, but like, if you're doing two, like this two divided by four, oh, yeah, two divided by one equals two, and two divided by two equals one. That's wrong, right? Is there any other number that can work? No. That's why it's true. Because I don't have a third case. Here, I can also go to 4 divided by 4. Oh, 1. Yep, so I have three cases there. I can only have two for it to be prime. So let's try. We agree that 2 is prime. Easy way to remember it for me, because it took me forever to stop writing down 1 in my primes is that the first prime number is even, and it's the only even prime number. How about three? Let's check three. What can I divide three by? One works, I get three. Does two work? No. Nope. Does three work? Yeah. Does, so every number between one and three, uh, one works here, that's prime. What's the next one, Drew? Uh, I guess five. Yeah, five. Five, five divided by five is one. Can't divide by two, can't divide by three, can't divide by four, can't divide by itself. So that's really your test. Can you count the natural numbers as the divisor of it? Then we have seven, eleven. All the odd numbers. Except for two. Every prime after two is odd. But not all the odd numbers because nine doesn't fit. Oh, most of the Nine is actually kind of the opposite of a prime. It's a special. It's a, it's a perfect square. Yep. So it would also be 25. Would 25 fit? No. No, 25 doesn't fit because it's divisible by 5. So what happens is the further we go down this line, the larger the gaps get. Here, difference of 1, difference of 2, difference of 2, difference of 4, difference of 2 again. What's the next number? 17? Yeah, and then 21. What about 19? 19. Hey, yeah, 19. 21 works, 7 and 3. Oh. Right. I think since we're pretty much up to this number, right, we're not going to find a prime that is divisible by a higher than halfway there. So let's check ourselves. Varun, can I divide? Oh no, this was Abby's question. Abby, can I divide 27 by 2? No, right? And that was where you asked, what's the next prime number? It's 3. Is 27 divisible by 3? Nine, right? Is nine prime? Nope. What, what's the smallest prime that I can divide nine by? Perfect. Now I chose 27 for a reason because when we pull these out, anything that I can group in pairs, because there's an understood two for square root, that automatically comes outside. You can bring out groups of two to leave this, basically 27 is three times three times three. And it tells me I need two of each number to get outside. That's like the entry fee. I need two threes, so three makes it out. I don't have another partner for this guy. He stays, and I end up with three square root of three. Yeah. How do you check if you did it right, though? Yep, that's it. Again, this is an understood two here. 
If I want to go back inside, my friend group, my two threes, have to split up. Right? They don't share, let's say these are siblings and they don't share a bedroom. In the house, they each get their own room, but for safety and numbers, they leave the house. Is three squared is nine, and three times nine is 27. So that's how that works forward and backwards. Now you're looking at it and you're saying, what if I had that? One seventeen squared. Right here? So the opposite, so if I gave you two squared, and I took the square root of that, right? What would the answer be there? It would be two because two squared, square root, well two squared is four, and the square root of four is plus or minus two. We're in geometry, and I said you don't have to worry about negative, so let me erase that. So if addition and subtraction are opposites, squaring and square root are the opposites. Now, just like when we introduce you to multiplication in elementary school, your identity was one times any number is the number you're multiplying one by, right? Four times one is four. Here, you understand that the coefficient now is a one, right? Because there's nothing there. It's understood here that this is a two. And when you go into algebra two, you're going to spend a whole quarter basically learning what happens when you have this. And then, because it's understood two, but now we're using the third group, we're going to add a three there. And this means we have to do everything and get to three now. And then x to the fourth, the opposite of that, is just the fourth root. What's that? It's very, very fun. Huh? It's very, very fun. It, it is in this format. I hate this format. And it drives me nuts to write it. You're going to learn that you can rewrite these right here. This is equal to x to the one fourth power. How do you that space, makes it easy. How do you space something that's like, I know there's like this, this, is, this cube root, what? Cube what? root. Okay, this is technically called a quarter, or four in four, right? Four root. Just do this, fourth root, fifth root, sixth root, seventh root. Yeah, keep it easy. Just like in geometry, we can learn what a dico heck is, sigo genre, or just call it a quarter cube. You know what I mean? All right, sorry, completely off the rails there, but Abby, does that answer your question as to what happens when it's not divisible by two? You just go through the prime numbers until you surpass the number underneath. If you don't get anything, then itself is prime. When you find numbers, that's what you call them, it's not Here? Oh, now I see why you... Wait, I understand how they work, how they coordinate, but when you use it, then you know what they do. Like you, okay, so you're good at doing this part. Sure. Don't be... <laughs> Let me take a step. Okay, say your say your part again so I can listen. I understand how the at the top how they coordinate together. How do you know when to use them? Like when you find the prime numbers, you keep that on the outside of the square root. Gotcha. Let's do for this class. When I did the Pythagorean theorem, second degree, second degree, second degree, right? I remember earlier when we were talking, we had R0 was zero dimensions, R1 was one dimension, R2. This is in two dimensions. This is also in two dimensions. It stays the same. Basically, whatever this number is, goes here. So here we had A squared, B squared, C squared. So I'm taking the square root, right? Now, if I had instead, then this would be the square root of something, but not square root, cube root. It matches the exponent that you use. What you can't do right now, now there's nothing to do here if I had a squared, b cubed, c cubed. That, you don't do anything with. If all three of these match, then that's where this number is right here. So think of it as this way. a to the x is equal to Wow, that would be messed up. Root x. Whatever x is in the exponent goes outside the radical. And then is it a part of the answer in the end? Yes. So we did the cube root, we did the square root of 27, and we got 3 square root of 3, right? 
If I do the cube root of 27, the smallest prime number is still 3. Leaves me with 9. 3 and 3. Because this is a 3 out here, everything has to come out in groups of 3. So this is just 3. If you want to check it, right, because cube root opposite is cube, what is 3 to the third power? Three times three is nine, times three is twenty-seven. So the exponent becomes the part on the outside of the rectangle. Oh my god, that's a This is algebra two though. And uh, in geometry, it's always safe to assume there's a two here. We're not working in three dimensions until topic eleven, and we're not taking actually we are taking cube groups, so we'll do that in a few minutes. Thank you. Oh Say again. Thank you. You're welcome. Hopefully it didn't confuse you or you're just being polite. I hope not. Any other questions before we move on? We have a lot to do. Well, I know. It'll go faster as we get through the heavier duty stuff. Okay. All right. That's a good thing. That means everyone was asking questions, and hopefully, if I was Abby, everyone understood better what their question was. <laughs> This is from the homework, this is from the test. Yeah, this is you guys have class. seen this, unless you're in Mr. Mitchell's class <laughs> multiple times. That was Only because we didn't test on this topic. Now, I'm going to say we can spend all day doing this, or I chose this problem because I want to say, topic 10 is really important, but does that mean every time I do this, I have to go to topic 10 to get my answer, or can I take a shortcut with something else we learned? Bree, thank you. Bree said we can use a shortcut. I'm going to do something here. If I look at this quadrilateral, I can make a new line segment. Excuse me. Is anyone going to argue with that? That's perfectly fine. What happens here now is a couple things fall out from that. The length of QZ is equal to the length of QC. Why do I make that statement? Because I have two triangles on the board, I want to break them up. Here's B, Q, Z. And here, can you see this? Caleb, can you see my screen? Oh, wait, thank you. She did take one. Let me know. I have BQZ up top. I also have C. Bruin, you read my mind. Wait, no. And then C to Z is the right angle. And what's left? Q. Now, I did two huge things here. I broke these up and I orientate them so that the corresponding parts go together. Right? Q and Q, Z and Z, B and C. Now, B and C are the only ones that don't, you know, match up letter for letter. But if I think about this, if I reflect over QZ, won't B map onto C? If I were to imagine that I were to take this right here, like it was a sheet of paper and fold it, wouldn't this angle line up with that angle? Yeah. All right, Varun, now you made a really good point. What's the measure of angle B? Angle B is 90. Yep. What about angle C? <coughs> angle C is 90. So those are the root. Perfect. Wait. Do you use like half, um, half the F A F? We're going to do that, but we're actually going to use a different one. But yes, that's where I'm heading with this. What can I say about the length of QZ and the length of QZ? They're congruent, right? It's the same line. So I'm going to mark that. Do I have any information that would tell me either ZB and ZC are congruent or CQ and BQ are congruent? Sydney, what do we have? Well, don't we have to do um, AAS? You know, you can't do AAS because it's not backwards. Right, you can't do any backwards, forwards, or backwards. 
But let's just see if we can poach a little bit more information off this diagram. Let me erase this now that we have it on. Do I know by any chance that let's say from C to Z is the same as B to Z? No, right? I don't know yet because it didn't give me six. I don't have the theorem. But what do I know? There is something else on there. It goes back to the very first thing we started talking about, parts of the circle. Let me give you a hint. The circumstance? I mean, technically you're right. What is AQ equal? But it's way too much work. Are there any other lines on this board right now that AQ is congruent to? QC. QC, QD. By what? How is Y? Oh, the radius of the circle. They're all radial, right? Now look here. QC, QB. So all of them should have been the same values. Are the same, right? Because they're radial. Now if I come over here, QB, QC. Now I can say, Varun said, what did you say to start with? SSA? No, SAS. Yeah. Let's see if we can do SAS. Wait, I have a, I have a question. Yes, sir. Should AQ be the same thing? Yep, that's what, yeah, sorry. That's what I drew here. Oh. Now, Varun's onto an idea, Sydney's onto an idea. Now, Varun said he wanted to use SAS, right? Yeah, I don't know how to use it for SAS. That's why we're going to talk about it. And this is why this part's going to go slow. We're going to talk about a lot of this, and then we'll be able to apply it through the rest. If I want to do side to side, that means my first move must be to go from a side to an angle without missing more than one step. So I'm not going to use the side in the middle because that wouldn't make sense. So let's say if I start here, my next move would have to be an angle either in this direction or this direction. Do I have that information? No. Nope. So I can't use side angle side. Sydney, what was the one you said? No. If you say I changed my mind, that's fine. when we covered it. If I'm trying to show congruency in triangles, and I see that they're both right triangles, ask myself the three questions. Number one, are they both right triangles? Yes. Are their hypotenuses congruent? Yes. Yep. And that's given because QZ is QZ. Right? Right here. My last question is, is there a pair of corresponding congruent legs? Yes. Now, I'm stressing the word corresponding. That means they're in the same position on the triangles, and they're equal. What are my corresponding congruent legs then, Hala? We don't know these are congruent, right? And we've already covered this one. Are these both on the bottom in this orientation and equal? Corresponding means they're in the same position when I orientate them correctly, and they're equal. So then my third question is yes. Anytime I say yes to all three of these, these are congruent by the hypotenuse leg term. Now, it doesn't take much to imagine that if I just did that whole proof or whatever by this one extension of the line, it's going to work for these other three triangles, right? If I make both quadrilaterals and this triangle. That means that this and this are congruent. Follow the same steps, different letters. This and this are congruent. Seven, seven. And seven and seven. seven. How do I find the perimeter, guys? Right. Add them up, right? Yep. I have two sixes. I have two sevens. And I think I have two fives. 12 and 14 is 26. With 10 more, it's 36. So, our, like, this should be our final slide for section 10, all right, Bruce? Yeah. Oh, yes. I wanted to end section 10's review by saying, as important as it, is, as it is to know everything in section 10, do not fixate on the idea that you have to only use it 
that knowledge from then, if it looks like it's a deduction 10 in question. This was so much easier with topic three. Use all of your skills to make it easier, but know that knowing everything is the best way to free question. some master setting of those ratios and either setting up the ratios or finding the angle. So again, sine opposite over hypothesis. Now, I could spend 10 minutes doing the Sokotoa and all of that. If you took the practice test on 5556 five, or 57 five, if I turn block eight, this is a copy, copy and paste, yeah. This is a screenshot, that's the way they use it. This is a screenshot of your formula sheet. So you'll have this on your formula sheet during the EOC. So I don't want to spend time getting everyone to stand up and chant, so we go and all that. I want to make sure you guys can apply it. Normal school year, Bree or somebody would stand in the corner, and then we would shout out one, and she would give us the right answer, and then I'd throw candy at everyone, and then we would move on. But we're not going to do that right now. We will go get candy in a little bit. Any questions on just how sine, cosine, and tangent are set up over here? Is it going to be about identifying the parts? That's exactly what's going to What's the next slide? Okay, so now we have that. Let's talk about what these are talking about. Capital letters denote angle. Alright, we said that starting in chapter 4, we really got into it in chapter 8. Somehow, in my mind, I wrote capital letter instead of just the letter A. So, if you see a capital letter, it's telling you it's looking at an angle. Alright, this wants me looking at angle A, and from angle A, finding the side that's opposite, and dividing it by the hypotenuse. 
What we're going to do today is sine cosine tangent of angle A. Then we're going to do sine cosine tangent of angle B and see how they are related. Then we're going to use all six of those and show that they give the same answer every time. So when I say ratio of the sides, that's just a fraction produced by the sides. And we'll do that in just a second. I guess I didn't need to print all three of these out for you. Now, we have sine here, and we have to talk about inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent. And just like I hinted at earlier, if I have the number three, and then I add two, and immediately subtract two, don't I always end up back with what I started with? Add anything and subtract the same amount, you're back where you started. Here, this three is like our theta. If I know that this angle here is a set amount, and I want to find the sine of it, if I find the inverse sine of it, this is like adding, this is like subtracting, and it's only going to leave me with what I started. Now this is going to be important when we set up and we have something like, and I ask you, to find the angle, right? This is the ratio of the sides. To switch back to the angle, I'm going to do that second sign, and it's going to pull that out. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be 0.6. It's going to give you the answer. Well, it will be 0 0.6. Taking the inverse sine of sine will give me whatever theta it is. If I set up the ratio of the sides and then do the inverse function from what I set it up for, it'll actually tell me what the angle is. Now, I wrote all this out. The next slide, as you see, is just a blank triangle. I'm going to draw a bunch of these, and we're going to do them over and over again. What I want to make sure you guys get is that these are inverse operators, just like plus and minus. Undo each other, these undo each other. The nice thing is here that this answer is just three fifths. Not bad. So let's try it. Oh, this, is the hmm? this, this is a triangle, right? This will be a right triangle. Sine, cosine, and tangent in this respect can only be used in right triangles. Rune, do you want theta to be at the top or the left? Theta? Yes. Uh, on top. On top, thank you, sir. You want to call that A or C? A. Perfect. Here we have angle A, angle B. And we'll see. Let me ask just a poll. Would you guys rather me put actual numbers for the size length or other variables? I think if I put variables, it gets confusing. But if I put numbers, every once in a while you look at it and think it has to be those numbers. So what do you prefer? Numbers? Numbers? Okay. I'm going to go with. <coughs> Yeah, but it won't be. Now, I'm going to use a Pythagorean triple because I want our answers to work out and make sense. Let's start. We have theta and A. So the first thing I want to do is find the sine of A. Yeah, you'll definitely need a calculator. And you're going to get that long speech about making sure it's in degrees, not anything else. Three. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to do all of it just because they want us again. When I write the sine of A, I know that I'm looking for the opposite over the hypotenuse. That's a general rule of sine. Putting this A in here means I need to make this my, what I'm going to call, reference angle. That means what, from A, what is the reference to the opposite side? Now, when I do this, even though I don't need adjacent in this case, when I was learning it in my study group in Dr. Soash's class, everyone would sit down and go, 
What's the opposite? And they would say four, and then two guys would say three, and then we would argue. And the way we finally settle these arguments is this. First, So, we're going to draw a line to the opposite side by bisecting the angle. And this is not something you're going to do for the rest of your life. This is going to be something that you do where your brain will eventually just pick it up and do it immediately. Here's my angle A. If I bisect it, I'm going to go right down the middle. And that line will always... Alright. If I tried to do that, it wouldn't work. That line will always point at the opposite side. So four is opposite of A. So I can go ahead and say, when A is my reference angle, my opposite is four. Now, everyone in here knows that this points, right? The second thing I do, Identify the hypotenuse. That's five. My right angle marker points at the hypotenuse every time. And three. Even though we don't need it this time, adjacent is the leftovers. So, I've identified the opposite of A. I'm not going to put hypotenuse of A because this is just strictly the hypotenuse of the triangle, and no matter which reference thing I use, that's always going to be the hypotenuse. And that makes you, number three, the adjacent of A. So, before we calculate each of these, Rune, go ahead. Well, is AB basically parallel to C AC? AB will be, mm, don't put it, don't think of it that way. Just think of this as just a helper line. Yeah, don't try and put any theorems of five because this is just to help us see. Now, we're going to calculate these, but I want to find first the ratio of this cosine of A. That's the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So, Varun, what's going to be in my numerator? The numerator is going to be 3. Yes, sir. Is my hypotenuse ever going to change? Nope. Nope. 3 over 5, that means that's 3. No, 3 over now these are always presented in order, I think. I can't prove it because it's older than I am by a significant amount. Sine, cosine, tangent. Opposite is the easiest thing to find. You just bisect the angle. Hypotenuse is the second easiest to find. So if I get these two right, my leftover automatically goes on top of my hypotenuse for cosine. And then tangent, without being too confusing, is just both numerators in that order. Opposite over adjacent. Now, pre-talk, we'll talk about sine over cosine and what that means, or what is, what if I put a, never mind. What's five over four then? We don't have a name for that, do we? Hypotenuse over opposite? We will eventually. So, what I'm gonna do is ask you guys, and I'm gonna erase this so that my lines aren't confusing. I want you to find the sine of B, the cosine of B, and the tangent of B. Okay. Now, don't fall for this. This is the opposite of A when that's our reference angle. I said B, and I put B there. We don't want that one. We want C. All right? C is my. C is this guy over here. Yeah. So, take a minute. See if you can find the opposite, the adjacent, and the hypotenuse. And then I'll ask you guys, and then we're going to walk over to the teacher lounge. I need to use the restroom, and everyone that, well, everyone has to go, because I can't leave in everyone by yourself. But while I'm in there, I'm going to let you guys pick through the candy that they left for teacher appreciation week since it's over, and bring that back, and then, you know, revitalize. If you don't want candy, you just walk with us, just to get to walk in so nobody's left behind. So, wait, C is like the um, reference angle now. Yep. And that is 
C is four, or B, right? Uh huh. So C is this angle right here. Yeah. We need to identify what side is opposite of C, what side is adjacent to C, and what side is the hypotenuse. Oh, we have to do a three, all the three values. Yes, sir. Okay, it's not bad. For one thing I'm going to miss next year when you're not in my class is the number of times that you accidentally unmuted and I hear, oh my gosh, oh, this is easy. Every time you do that, you'll hear, oh gosh, this is, oh, it's so easy. I always think I've ruined this guy's day. It's the last walk of the day. We have 10 minutes of class and I hear, oh my gosh, oh, this is easy. I'm going to miss that next year. Don't worry about the calculator yet. What's my numerator for the sign of C? Four out of five. Four out. Four slash five. For C, if I look at C, if I bisect the angle, where do I end up? Oh, that's the opposite. See, now this changes. This is the opposite of C. This is still the hypotenuse, and this is the adjacent. So, Varun, opposite over hypotenuse when I'm referencing C is what? So, it says three. Three over two, three, right? Yes, what's the hypotenuse, sir? Oh, hypotenuse five. Perfect. Pick somebody else for me for cosine of C. Three? Three. What's the cosine of C? Yep. Three. All I need you to do before we leave today is answer one question confidently and not this one. Who's telling him? I want you to do a math question confidently. Sydney, what's the tangent of C? Huh? C4. Again, easiest to find. Hypotenuse left over, and then bring the numerators in that order straight down. All right, we're going to run over the teacher's lounge. Let's all do that real quick. Let's get a lap in. I'm going to use the restroom. There's also granola bars. I don't think there's enough ice cream left to offer to everybody. If you guys need to use the restroom, we'll make a stop at the boys' room, the girls' room, teacher's lounge.